it was hard. Like we didn't have money and seeing my parents struggle and, you know, family struggle. I sat down with mum and I said to mum, I, I love you and I'm going to work with you for a year. So I'm going to go into phones. And she she didn't understand it. Like, And there we grew it to like, what, 16, 17 shops. You got to just have that hunger, right? Like no one is going to stop you, right? And that's that mentality that I think every entrepreneur needs to have is that resilience that you're going to break walls, you're going to make stuff happen. Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to the Bay HQ, where we inspire, connect and guide the next generation of British Asians. Smash that subscribe button if you're watching this on YouTube and give us a five-star review if you're watching on Apple or Spotify. Today we have with us Asad Hamir, who's a portfolio technology entrepreneur. His brands include Click, OcuShield and Nolly. He's passionate about sustainability, design and innovation. How are you doing today? Yeah, really good. Real pleasure being on the podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me on. So we had a good chat before this started yeah. and I've had somebody you've invested in before, driven on the podcast yeah. before, so you've heard some of the OcuShield story. Yeah. But you've, like, as we said, like, you've got a portfolio now. You've done so many different things. Yeah. But where did this all start from? Like, where, what did Assad, when he was a kid, what did he think he was ever going to grow up and do? Yeah, so my dad was an IT engineer. So my, my dad was um, from that world. Mum um, and dad both came from East Africa. So mum from Uganda, dad from Tanzania. Dad was super smart. And so was mum, actually. Mum was actually, I think, the first optometrist, Asian optometrist in our community. So we're from a community called Kojas. Um, and she kind of started off a kind of revolution in our community of optometrists. Like uh, probably one in three people are optometrists. Uh, we actually hold the world record in our family, I believe. <laughs> this is kind of self-proclaimed. Yeah. We've got like 45 optometrists in our family. And I'm obviously an optometrist as well. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, so and and so mum was optometrist. I remember seeing photos of her with her in her sari in university and stuff like that. And so mum won won the argument between clearly between her and dad about what I should do. And yeah, so you, you your opinion didn't count for anything in this, I guess. Clearly not. <laughs> I was, at that point, I was more interested in Man United and like yep. gaming and stuff like that. But being around like tech all the time, and like I'd I'd go with that. Dad would be the IT guy, and you know he'd go to people's houses and repair stuff and I'd hold the tools and I used to love it. We'd open up the PC and you see the motherboard inside and, you know, I'm going to say it was beautiful. Like, you know, it's quite sad saying that, <laughs> but like, you know, seeing all the little chips and, and I just got a fascination for tech from a young age, really. I had, I had my first phone at like 15, 16, begged dad for it. And I remember like at that point, like, we weren't we weren't wealthy yeah like mum mum actually the family got in into optics and they had opticians in the family but no one really made any money like because it was a way in which everyone got educated everyone then you know to get jobs like they'd come into the family business and have a job there and and it was like you know when you got too many family members in a business it's like you know too many cooks spoil the broth and all that kind of stuff but yeah, I did optometry university and then third year uni, Steve Jobs got up on stage and said, look, here's iPhone. And I was reading all the blogs and, you know, everything. And I was like, I, I can't do optometry. And I sat down with mum and I said to mum, uh, you know, I, I love you. And, um, you know, I'm going to work with you for a year. So the plan was basically I finished my degree. You do a one year pre-registration. I'm going to work with you for a year, but I'm going to go into phones. And she she didn't understand it. Like, bless mum uh she says like everyone needs uh, you know everyone needs glasses everyone's got a phone right why does everyone no one's gonna need a phone are you like are you sure the mum like don't worry it'll, it'll be fine and actually at the time o2 had a partner program and in our mosque it was the only uh, mobile phone network that worked we were, were at the top of uh, stanmore hill and it was a it was an area which basically was a black spot for all mobile phone networks but the only network that worked was o2 so i was like I went and saw the commercial terms and I, and I kind of thought to myself, I, I could sell this and I could sell it if I just do it in my community. There's like 5,000 people I could sell phones to and everyone's going to want this thing. And that was the beginning of a fantastic journey where like, you know, to start a business at 21, 22 with the backing of a big brand and also like the support of a big brand was just amazing. And I, I like, I think in that program, there was like 4,000 applications and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And somehow they saw something in me, like... Um, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. At 21, what experience did you have? Did you anything in past that 
maybe convince him that, yeah, you're the one to give the contract to? Yeah. So like growing up, like that same tech background, I did like websites, so fixed computers, uses some of that knowledge. I used to go to like uncle's houses and fix things. And it's funny because they'd go, right, okay, what, like, let me give you 50 quid. And I'd go, oh, buy me a scanner or buy me like another piece of tech. So I was that in, in like, you know, that, that into tech that I just wanted more and more tech and then like actually at uni I started a website called Sunglasses Express I used the family's Luxottica and Safalo accounts so, so basically like the likes of Ray-Ban and Armani and all these kinds of guys they don't actually make their own eyewear they use a big conglomerate called Luxottica Safalo you may have heard of it um, and so I use their accounts to then sell sunglasses online so I set up a website at that point and at that point there was like very little e-commerce right so we were one of the first companies in sunglasses doing it and I still remember we discounted Chanel and you're not, it's one of those areas you just don't go, you don't discount Chanel. And I remember the first month we generated about 20 grand of income, yeah, revenue. And it's like, wow, like, you know, I was yeah. 19 years old. Uh, Luxottica sent us an email saying, if you don't shut this website down in the next 24 hours, we've traced the frame, we've bought a frame, we've traced <laughs> it, we're going to trace it back to the account. And once we find out which account it is, we're going to shut that account down. That's my family's business. So I was like, oh, crap. And yeah. at that point, you know, didn't have the experience, all that kind of stuff. They probably were playing my bluff, right? Yeah. But I shut it down. So, but like amazing experience, right? From yeah. At that age, generating some income and stuff like that. So lots of hustles, basically. Lots of little hustles, failures, successes, all kinds of stuff. So did you always just have, I guess, with your, like your experience with your dad, right? Was that kind yeah. of what made you think? why not just try let's do this let's do that is that where the mentality came from or was it quite common in like your community as well because you said about or you the guy who was doing that yeah do you know what like amongst my friends like growing up like none of them really had that business mindset but I think like going into mum's opticians all the time and going there and, and you go in and you see their hardship you see their hustle and like they start you off in like when you go in you have to work in the family business right and they start you off selling uh, kids glasses yeah, so kids glass kids are really hard to sell glasses to, right? Because like all different shapes and sizes and like yeah, fittings, and then you got to contend with mum and dad, and they go, oh, I like it, don't like it, all this kind of stuff. So you learn how to sell from a like, young age, being in that environment, and and I think I got the love and the buzz of a deal, and I still I still love a deal, right? Anyone that knows me that I love a deal, and so you know. Like when you get that buzz, I think then like it stays with you, right? And then you yeah. want more buzzes, and and at that point you it you're playing, right? I always describe it as like you know it's you got to be in this playful mindset when you're in business. And at that point, I was playing, right? I love tech, and I was doing websites, and you know, and then I was getting deal and making money. So the making money was like part of the fun, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I think it's all these kinds of experiences that kind of like have led me to doing what I do now, I guess. You know, with the part about the website getting shut down, right? Yeah. Because it's one of the things I think as well, whenever it's something to do with legal stuff, that's yeah. when I get freaked out. Yeah. Or, or even like the tax stuff, right? Anything to do with yeah. where it's a bit like that kind of area. Yeah. It's all the other business stuff is I, I'm comfortable with. It's yeah. nice. Like it's just fun. Like you said, playing. Yeah. But when it comes to somebody sending you that kind of letter yeah. and saying they're going to shut you down. Yeah. Did that like sort of disrupt you for a bit did it put you off your game thinking oh do i do something like this again what if i'm gonna get in trouble yeah or did you able were you able to overcome that quite quickly and start something new good thing was we made our money back for the website so the website was about three four grand right mm -hmm. so i kind of moved on from it quite quickly mm -hmm. i think what i learned now reflecting back on it i've always been quite resilient and that's like like telecoms is a is a tough industry and we can talk about that but going through that that industry you have to be bloody resilient and i think i get that from my upbringing it was hard like we didn't have money and you know like all my friends had like stuff that i wanted and you know and seeing my parents struggle and you know family struggle and and all that stuff and like my next door neighbors were drug dealers you know and uh, they you know uh, yeah they'd like played loud music you know, till weekends and night and you go through all of that and a tough upbringing and it builds you, you know, it's character building and, you know, public school, you learn to survive. And, you know, so I think all of those things, like they're laying little seeds, right? So then when yeah. you do get these torpedoes coming in, you're like, it's not that bad, right? Like, yeah. but yeah, look, legal stuff is, is, is always 
like you always got to look at it very diligently right so. yeah because so you mentioned with the o2 shops right because obviously yeah. that they expanded quite significantly yeah and it's a different type of entrepreneurship right what you're doing before is you're you're doing lots of different things in the hustle yeah but then to go from that to then scaling something yeah how was that adjustment like how did you once you got that first contract with o2 yeah how did you take that from like one shop to what you then took it to yeah so like the first kind of part of the O2 relationship was the kind of franchise relationship and there we grew it to like what 16 17 shops and there it's literally you just got to perform telecoms is an industry where if you perform you'll get rewarded and people your numbers talk your numbers do the talking and for me like I just sold like crazy so I would go to my community I'd come in in the morning I'd do all the contracts and then I'd literally leave at 2 3 p.m bags uh, my car full was a VW Polo at the time and I'd drive around to all the uncles and aunties and drop off my phones and I'd set them up and, and all that kind of stuff so we had that nice blend of we were performing in store I had a motivated team in store and then you know separately i was doing lots of external mm. business um, so i think that combination of the two and then like then you then you can go from one to two to three to five stores you got to learn to lead right and you got to learn to like manage people and wow that is like a that's a real step up right and that is you have to go on that journey right of what is good leadership and i was very lucky that i hired some really good people who actually i learned a lot from and, you know, at that age, 21, 22, 23, everyone's older than you, right? So I was mad, like, I still remember I had the sales director once who was like 50 and I'm like 25, 26 year old. And he had me wrapped around his little finger, yeah. you know, and you learn from those situations, right? You learn from those leaders, those, those people on that journey. So like, I think a big thing that the O2 stuff taught me was that leadership element because ultimately there's no USP, right? You're selling the same phone that everyone else is. Prices are, we can get probably a better price online, right? You're selling service, right? And um, I learned that from my, my mom and her opticians business and I kind of carried that forward into here. But the leadership bit is the bit that, you know, when you go from like just you and another dude on the shop floor to 200 people in four or five years, you got to learn, man. You got to learn very quickly how to lead people. Like even I remember I couldn't public speak and like things like that and getting very nervous, you know, and you just have to throw yourself in the deep end and and you, it's either kind of sink or swim. But then from there, we then evolved that business because we were such high performers. We went into other areas of O2. So it's amazing how in an organization like that, if you perform, you do well, opportunities open up. Everyone wants a piece of the pie, right? But they also want to protect their pie right so it's really interesting how those dynamics work where they'll want to avoid you getting distracted with something else right because then you're going to be not focused on their thing that's making them money and so there's all these types of things that start to happen when you start working with these corporates super interesting because you start to learn about corporate behavior as well which also has helped stand me in good stead now i think now i sell into corporates or you know whether it's in oki shield and we're selling into corporates that kind of understanding how a big corporate behaves and you know all those funny nuances so. You mentioned there about like being so young and having to manage so many people. Yeah. And was there any times where you, did you doubt yourself at any point during that time where you'll think, like you said, the 50 year old sales manager, you're at and a singer yeah. about like, it must've been so overwhelming, right? Because you went from what, like you said, two people on a shop floor to like 200 yeah. people. Was there any point where you're like, oh, am I the right person for this? Or how did you keep that resilience going and keep that belief? Like, yes, I can keep doing this. Yes, I can yeah. lead this. Because it's often a different type of leader who can run a single shop. Yeah. versus somebody who can run 200 people. And yeah. like you said it's very different skills. Yeah. So like, how was that journey for you? Did you yeah. just take it on or was it sometimes like, oh, actually, I don't know about this? Yes, yeah, so I had, uh, I actually, early doors, I merged my business with another O2 partner. And I had two mentors, two brothers, actually, Amar and Adash uh, Radia. And they were from Kenya and uh, Indian boys and like, and, you know, very similar values, like, you know, uh, upbringing, all, all of that kind of stuff. And I learned a lot from them, actually. Like, they were a few years ahead of me. Like, uh, I think Amar is 10 years older than me. Adash is like seven years older. So they were both co-founders of Dishroom as well, the restaurant group. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so learning from them, seeing them and seeing how they approach things and being a sponge from everyone, right? Like 
you know, seeing O2, I mean, O2 was the mobile network, right? Like, the, I remember when they first announced themselves at, in Arsenal, the Arsenal guys came out with their O2 and they're like, what is this O2? And like, and did that make you want to stop selling O2? Because you were spot, spot your life. Uh, Arsenal became my second team. <laughs> so, yeah, so we used to, being, being one of the top formers, we'd always get box seats at Arsenal. I used to love it because I used to then go and sell to everyone at Arsenal, <laughs> to all the stewards and all the players. And we, we yeah, we, we did all of that. Every opportunity, right? Every mm-hmm. single, every single person you speak to because i had a product everyone needed right so i was like every person i speak to is an opportunity right but obviously you don't sell to them you build a relationship and you know and it goes from there but coming back to your point i think it helped i was young right so you have that fearlessness and i didn't know anything better right but of course you have those days where you're like god like i've been destroyed and i do i did a bad pitch or whatever it is but i think I was able to just dust myself off and go again. And I kept going and I kept going and kept going and kept going. And that's what got me to that point. And I think Amar especially, he has this belief, he has this thirst for learning. Yeah. And I really got that from him. Like he's that thirst and that stayed with me. I like, if I'm not good at something, I'll keep going and I'll keep learning and I'll keep trying. And something I've just learned that you can improve yourself in anything right of course you're naturally skilled in a certain area right but you can improve your skills in anything you just got to keep practicing what's the main way you learn today because like and it's for me it's changed yeah. I, before i used to read a lot yeah. whereas now this is how i learn right? i'm talking to people like you all the time yeah definitely. and i'm asking you the questions i want to know for myself and i learn definitely. that way right yeah how do you learn now because you've got you've got to a position now where i guess you're further ahead than some of the other people you might have yeah. previously looked up to yeah where do you like who do you learn from or, or what do you use to learn so definitely like you said like meeting other people learning from them you know meeting people on linkedin grabbing zoom calls a podcast you know all of that kind of stuff i even like trainings i went to a training course recently with a guy called mahmoud moji like phenomenal sales and leadership coach the pe- not only for what i learned off him but his coaches and the people that are on that that course yeah like it just just be a sponge in every way possible and always look for those opportunities to learn right like i'm not a big reader personally like i i get really bored of books and i always have done so i like podcasts i like just like tube tube drives like you know i always download stuff and try and avoid spotify music and you know try and try and get a podcast in right so it's just replacing those those moments right dinners lunches use it as an opportunity to learn and and you know like i learn from my staff i learn from from everyone right and i think if you just have that mindset that you know like you're never finished right you're never finished and this is a like a this is all a journey and an experience and i kind of think of myself like i shouldn't be doing what i do right now if i'm honest like, i'm an optometrist right <laughs> like i come from a background where neither of my parents really were in business right so i haven't learned this from like my family right but i've learned right and i've learned and i keep learning right and i think finally i'd say is you got to just have that hunger right like no one is going to stop you right and that's that mentality that i think every entrepreneur needs to have is that resilience that you're going to break walls you're going to make stuff happen with that hunger as well because obviously you're doing so well at o2 yes you could have just happily been like okay i'm just gonna do this now this is yes. easy i know what i'm doing i'm a high performer yeah but you've expanded and gone into other things too yeah and what was behind that decision what was the motivation to keep going and trying out other things too so interesting, I had godlike tendencies because I think when you get to that point and everything's going right, like everything, <laughs> you think like you can take do anything, right? And I actually started an eyewear business called Kite and I actually failed at it. And that was a real kind of, uh, you know, Mike Tyson punch in the face <laughs> moment. And I forgot at that point, actually, everything that I had learned that had got me to that point, which was I hustled, I did everything myself, I drove everything from the front, leadership. I just... I started throwing money at things, recruiting this leader who's like done something in some major company, bringing them into the position, paying them a super salary because they were like the super smart person that's going to, you know, deliver me all this value. And I put my took my foot off the pedal. And yeah, like it's amazing how when you have money, yeah, you start to make stupid mistakes. And that's exactly what happened. And I lost money. I lost serious personal wealth, like three to four million pounds. Yeah, my personal cash, my personal money. Luckily, it happened to me at a point in my life where I could recover, right? And I did, you know, at that point, I had lost everything, right? I'd lost a sizable chunk of my wealth. But at that point, I was like, I'm going to make sure 
this never happens again. And I'm also going to make sure it never happens again to anyone else, right? And so a big part of what I love to do as well is work with other startups and scale ups. I'm working with Druvin and a couple of other mm-hmm. ones. Um, and yeah, like, you know, you know, it's really painful when you lose your own money, right? It's really humbling as well. And it still, however many years later, four years later, I still feel the pain, but you've got to use that pain, right? And mm-hmm. and that's what I do now. Like I I make sure that I don't make those mistakes. And look, you will still make mistakes, right? I still make mistakes, but it's like making sure that you don't lose some of those basic principles of business. Like there's some basic things that got you to that point. Yeah. I love that you voluntarily shared that because sometimes people get to a stage where they are, like where you are now, where they like to create this illusion that, Everything they did is perfect. No. When it's not, right? It's like even people who are very, very smart and done very, very well, they still make mistakes. They can still lose money. It's not everything you're going to do is perfect. Mm. But like you said, you learn from those mistakes and you keep going. Yeah. And so obviously now you're focusing on, you said like, say you've got OcuShield, you've got Noli, you've got like Click. Yeah. If we go for like each, so OcuShield we covered with Drew Vince. Yeah. People listening want to know more about OcuShield. Probably like yeah, you yeah. can listen to that Drew Vince episode. Drew Vince podcast. Yeah. We yeah. do a much better job than me. Yeah. Because like <laughs> obviously you're a part of it and you've, people watch Dragon's Den, they'd yeah. have seen you there as well. Yeah. But we've got other things to cover. So yeah. like listen to Drew Vince about that one. Yeah. But tell us about Click. Like what's behind that? What? Why do you care about that? Why is that a yeah. company you created? Yeah. So like Click, as I mean, just starting from where. I believe Click started from is is our upbringing. So like coming from East Africa, like parents had nothing, right? Sustainability was actually built into our DNA. And we just didn't know it at that point. Come to our houses, you got the cellophane on the sofas and cling film on the remote controls. And mum would like put the ketchup bottle. Mum's going to hate this if I say <laughs> this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, put water in the ketchup bottles and, you know, use every last drop. And like, so, you know, you're taught to do more with less from a young age, right? And then like growing my business is the same principle right like i remember our first shop like i did it in like 25 grand and everyone's like we all spent like 60 grand on our shop how did you do it with 25 grand i was like because i hustled right Mm -hmm. so you have this mentality of doing more with less and all the way through my business career i had that and with our tech i made sure from the beginning anyone that needed a laptop i always used refurbished tech right i'd always buy it because my dad had this it background he taught me how to repair and so i'd bring the devices in i'd repair them get them ready and even up to employee number i think 100 plus i used to do it all Right. I used to get it ready. Let someone leave. Then someone would say, oh, let's buy a new laptop for the new. I was like, no, we got this laptop. I'll just I'll sort it out on the weekend. You know, I'll I'll change all the stuff. I'll reinstall it. Don't worry. Yeah. For me, it's like a little hobby. And so that was all happening. And then the business was growing. In 2018, I had an employee join the business. Her name was Nita. And Nita was a financial controller. And I personally hired her. Yeah. Really passionate about her. Financial controller. We could communicate. She was good on the numbers. She was commercial. She's like a find, right? Like, she was amazing. And I was so excited about her. She joined and she actually called me a week later. She had her laptop. I didn't set it up. She got it from um, Ben, who's one of my ops guys, and got the laptop. And basically, she called me and she said, my laptop has, uh, you know, uh, no, she, she actually called me and she said, I need, to, I need to speak to you. And so we sat down and um, I was like, oh, 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 like, you know, something's <laughs> wrong here. Yeah. And she slammed the laptop on the table and she goes, you don't care about your staff. Look at this laptop. It's got sticky keys, it's got USB ports not working, all this kind of stuff. She says, I'm resigning. Yeah. I was like, what? And I couldn't believe it. And she, you know, like any high performance candidate, she's going to have another offer from something. And what she's realized is this is a red flag and something's not right here. They don't, they can't even sort out my tech, right? And I'm going to go for this other job. Now, the other job was paying her an extra 10 grand as well, right? <laughs> but that was, that's another story. So she ended up resigning, going to some job. And I was reflecting on it. I was like, Jesus, like this has actually generated such a large trigger moment that she's left the business, right? For me, I've lost some of my recruitment fee, yeah? Mm -hmm. I was like, Jesus, like why is, how has this happened? I started looking around and saying like, who is solving this kind of issue? Can't be that every business out there needs someone like me in it to like repair PCs and help them be more sustainable and all that kind of stuff. And I couldn't find anything. And so at that point, I was like, I'm really well placed to do this. I know the industry. I know everyone. Apple had just had a profits warning in 2018 as well. And that was seen to be the slowdown of the hardware market. And I started putting dots together. I was like, 
I could do this, right? And we can basically create a business model, which is there to service business customers, help them be more sustainable, unlock the potential of sustainability in business. And the UK is actually the worst nation in the world per capita for ele- electronic waste, mm. which is like crazy when you think yeah. about ahead of the USA, ahead of China, right? Per capita, incredible. And we're just a sucker for Apple launches. We're a sucker for new tech here. European nations are so much further ahead of, of us when it comes to refurbished tech. And so, yeah, at that point, I was like, I'm going to do this. Uh, November 2020, we started the business and lockdowns hit. <laughs> so, and yeah, and and it was hard at that point to start a business. Um, but yeah, 2021, we started getting going. Uh, we built the workshop. So we built our own engineering team. And I, I, I felt that was really important because no one else in the industry was checking devices. It was clear. You buy stuff from Music Magpie and places like that, you get them in 20% of the time, there'd be issues with it. No one was checking anything. And we were like, we have to deliver industry leading uh, technology that's reliable yeah equivalent to if someone buys from apple apple's return rate was like three percent i was like mm-hmm. we had to deliver the same right and to do that we have to invest in engineering so at that point we opened our workshop we started hiring engineers um and yeah that was the start of the kind of hardware side and then started looking at um it's not just the hardware it's actually the it infrastructure the cybersecurity piece and all those things. And actually in 2023, Zahid uh, joined as my co-founder. And Zahid's background, he is 15 years in Accenture, five years in Deloitte, and he's led some of the largest cybersecurity teams globally, like sort of the FCA, London Stock Exchange. So what we're doing with Click is bringing that kind of reliability and that enablement when it comes to the circular or sustainable hardware, but also combining that when it comes to the IT infrastructure, cybersecurity and all those types of things so that when you've got your employees hybridized, you know that they are secure, you know that they're, you know, they're going to be looked after. So yeah, it's really, really exciting. It's like, even just listening to that, I can tell how excited you are about it. Yes. And it's, it's great when that comes across. Yeah. Because like the listeners can obviously tell when you listen as well, right? Yeah. But when I'm sitting in the room, your eyes are lighting up, yeah. like you're smiling as you're saying it. It's really clear. Yeah. If you quickly tell me, like, what's the ambition of Click, right? Where do you want it to get it to? Yeah. Yeah. So to today, we've been completely bootstrapped, right? So I'm just reinvesting profits, right? And the key thing was I need to build the infrastructure. I need to be able to deliver the service, right? That that business is like my business, right? Mm-hmm. So their employees are like my employees. I need to be able to deliver that quality of experience, right? Mm-hmm. At scale right? So we've made sure that we invest first and get that right. We're now ready to scale. So the run rate is about 130, 140k a month. We're profitable. We're now going to do a fundraise and really scale this business. I want to take this, I want to, I want to solve the e-waste problem in the UK first. Yeah. So this is a significant issue. E-waste is the fastest growing domestic waste challenge this earth faces. It's crazy how bad it is right now. And look, it's just been caused by proliferation of tech. You've had the pandemic, which, you know, has led to hybridization, deployment of tech, laptops, monitors, and all that kind of stuff. And as a result of that, it's just out of control. It needs to change. And so I really believe that if we can transition the UK to sustainable technology, if this can be a, you know, um, a blueprint for the world, right, for how businesses should enable with sustainable technology, that would be amazing. And then after that i'll go after the world because click is so exciting we haven't had much time left for noli yeah but could you give us like a one minute overview of what noli is and like why that's important to you too yes yeah, so and noli is a real passion project for me as well because i love design and like fruit tell my hat and glasses <laughs> and whatever right so i they love cool glasses if people are watching this on youtube thank you <laughs> thank you and like a lot of tech accessories in my view is very black and white very boring and i really felt at the time when i started noli that there's a space for a brand which is much more playful that is intelligent and has accessories which are gonna you know improve your daily life with your tech right but also are beautiful right why can't you combine those two worlds right also why is it not sustainable right why is there no talk about carbon emissions why is there no talk about materials and all those types of things so we're bringing together those things um, nolly sits under click as well so when we supply our devices we do it with nolly accessories and stuff like that so i'm building a little ecosystem there and i think it makes it it, it helps the click brand as well it, it kind of gives it a differentiation in that world as well but also it gives me that passion uh, for that stuff because i really really like that stuff um you know i love designing products love being in china love being in factories and you know pushing people to like deliver high quality products for me and for our customers so it's really exciting to see 
what I think even I can tell from this is that you obviously had very success at a very young age mm. and then you built and scaled and then you had different fairies along the way. Yeah. But then now you've got this completely new project, but it's like almost a kid again in the way you're talking about it. And like you've got 100%. this whole new challenge. I understand. And I think for people listening, they're listening from that. It's just that sometimes people think they get passionate about one thing. Yeah. And then when it's not that they don't get passionate about it anymore, but I think that's it, right? But it's like, you can pick up something later in life and be really passionate about it. It could be a new thing. And it doesn't need to be your thing forever. It could be like in 10 years time, you can have another idea that you really love as well. And you can build that too. But we're going to have to go for the quick fire questions now. Oh, cool. (laughs) So first one is who are free British Asians that you'd love to shout out. You think people listening right now should be paying attention to or following. So I'm going to start off with Salim, Salim Juma. He's not someone who's got a public profile, but he's someone that's been a mentor for me from like when I started my business career, he's also my brother-in-law, but he's a phenomenal entrepreneur, um, more of an old school entrepreneur, but the principles of entrepreneurship are, you know, universal, right? It doesn't matter which which um, area you're from. So yeah, he he started, he was the founder of I Emporium Opticians, so a retail business. And he just, he's all about integrity, customer experience, and just, he he's the most hardworking entrepreneur I've ever met. So that's the first one. Second one is Druven. So Druvin, and not because he shouted me out as well. Um, so so Druvin, Druvin is someone that I really get a lot of joy from because seeing him develop on his journey and what he's doing for his business and how, how I believe he's going to change eyes, you know, the eye category with what he's going to do is just someone that I really love. I, you know, love to have him as part of what I do and as a bro. And like, you know, I just want to say for him, he's he inspires me now, you know, like, and he always has, but like he's superseded me in many ways, you know, and it's amazing to see it. Number three, I would say, it's a, it's a guy called Amir Mashkor. Yeah, and Amir Mashkor is a, is a friend. It's someone that I met on the entrepreneurship journey. But he's he's um, he's he's on Instagram. He's on, he's on LinkedIn just about as well. Um, and he is he's a no nonsense entrepreneur, right? He's just someone you can sit down and like talk about stuff, and he'll just tell you as it is, right? And you know, Amir Amir said to me recently, "Just believe in yourself." You know, like going through some of the hardship I have uh, had with uh, the previous failure, you sometimes lose that kind of you know like oh i need to get funding and uh, you know i uh, don't think i could do this and and you know you need those people in your life who are not only there to like make sure that you stay on the straight and narrow but also there to inspire you and give you a slap around the fla- face and you know all that kind of stuff so those three yeah well obviously i've met driven before it's like amazing and yeah but next question is if people listening right now like are looking for help or guidance yeah what could they come to you about so I love meeting on other entrepreneurs, right? And I love to help, right? So I feel I've got a really wide experience of so retail, e-commerce, Amazon, B2B. I'm, I don't profess to be an expert in all of it. Definitely not an expert in crypto. So if you're in crypto or something, don't, don't come to me. But like, if you love to make things which are going to do things differently and you want someone who has those white hairs and give, will give you that experience, definitely come, let's have a chat. I'd love to love to from an entrepreneurship point of view you know um, if there's anything I can help with network you know ideas whatever it is I'm just keen to meet other entrepreneurs you know for me it's that's the the biggest thing of course if you need some sustainable tech or some refurbished tech or anything like that recycling your old tech give us a shout as well so the flip side I was going to say is anything that you need right now that somebody in the audience might be able to help you with yeah like um like for, for us now like we're really looking to scale the click business and for us there it's going to be how we chart and manage that journey for this to be one of the circular businesses in the UK and we've got a lot of challenges coming up for sure like scaling a business like that I mean I've scaled businesses but this is this is an IT and a technical business and so yeah if you've been in IT or you've been in those kinds of environments we've scaled tech businesses love to have a chat so enjoyed chatting to you so much today and oh, it's been a real I pleasure like we could do this for double the amount of time as well yeah for but sure, man. have you got any final words to the audience no just um it's been a real pleasure honestly and i i feel like i've been here like having watched like a lot of these binge them um and yeah just want to say thank you thank you for inviting me on and uh, just you know for everyone watching just keep doing amazing things Hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for listening. It means a huge amount to us. And we don't think you realise how important you are. Because if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, if you leave us a five-star review, it makes a world of difference. 
And if you believe in what we're trying to do here, to inspire, connect and guide the next generation of British Asians, if you do those things, you can help us achieve that mission and you can help us make a bigger impact. And by doing that, it means we can get bigger guests, we can host more events, we can do more for the community. So you can play a huge part. So thank you so much for supporting us.